right after the break, uh, just before we went for our break, we were um, studying chapter three and we were looking at how God prepares us. Okay. God prepares us through his word and then through the Holy Spirit. He also, God uses people to prepare us. Okay. So look at what Proverbs 27, 17 says. Can somebody read that please? Proverbs 27, 17. You have to use the, where's the mic? Read, read, read. Yeah, read. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the consistency of his friends. Continence of his friend. Strength. Okay, amen. Thank you. So here we see that each of us sharpen the other person. Are all of us perfect? No. So God uses imperfect people to sharpen imperfect people. Okay. So, God uses people uh, to help us move forward in our preparation pro process when he uses other people to speak into our lives, to train us, to teach us, so we can also learn from other people, okay? Then he also uses life experiences. Look at what uh, Romans chapter 5 verse 3 and 4 says. Can somebody read that please? Romans 5, 3 and 4. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations pro, uh, produces perseverance, perseverance. Pre perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character hope. Amen. So here we see that, you know, um, it's important for us to go through difficult times, right? Why is it important to go through difficult times? What does the Bible tell us when we go through difficult times? All of us have gone through difficult times. Yes. What does the Bible tell us when you go to difficult times? Look at James chapter 1 verse 2 and 4. Don't read it, but all of you look in your notes. What does it say when you go through trials, difficulties? What should you do? Count it all joy. Count it all joy. joy. That means the Bible is saying, hey, when you're going through problems, challenges, difficulties, think about it as a joy. Is it easy? No. Did we ever, did, can we even think of doing it? No, but the Bible is saying count it all joy. Why? Because when you go through those trials, what does it do? It produces, it tests your faith. It helps your faith to grow. It produces what? Patience. And patience, what does it do? Yes, does its perfect work. We are looking at James chapter 2, 1, verse 2 and 4. It's in your notes. Okay. And what does patience do? Makes you perfect. Complete. complete lack nothing. Lacking nothing. nothing. Amen? amen. Can we say an amen to that? Amen. amen. So what should you do when you go through problems and difficulties? Count it not as a sorrow and a big problem. Count it as a joy. Because we know that it's going to strengthen and build our faith. And our faith is going to bring about, do its perfect work. Because we are going to become perfect, complete, lacking nothing. Okay. So, you know, some of us don't want to go through problems and difficulties. We run away from it. So we think, okay, this job, such a problem I'm having with my boss. I leave it and go to the next job. Okay, you can take another job and go. But God is saying, hey, this is your preparation process. You go to the next job, you jump three jobs, you have to still have to be trained. You still have to work hard. You still have to do a lot of work. You're saying, hey, in this Bible college, there's a lot of rules, do's and don'ts. I have to get up so early. There's, so, there's no time for me to sleep. I'm going to go to another Bible college. Well, it's the same anywhere and everywhere. Life is not always easy for any one of us, okay? So if you jump out of God's preparation process, we try to go somewhere else, we jump into it, the same thing. Because God is going to still take us through those preparation process. He's going to bring you right back to where you are. He's going to start all over again. So we must allow God to prepare us. Because it says that, you know, we will grow into patience in growing our faith so that we can be mature, perfect, and complete okay lacking nothing so 
when you go through difficult times, don't take the escape route. Okay, just be patient with God. Look at what Hebrews 5, 8 to 9 says. Can somebody read that, please? Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Amen. So what did Jesus learn? How did Jesus learn? How did Jesus learn? Through I obedience. Suffered. And when he suffered, okay? He learned obedience to things that he suffered. So what makes us think that we can learn obedience any other way? When Jesus himself learned obedience through how? Through suffering. Then why do we think that we can learn obedience to any other way, even when the Son of God had to learn obedience through suffering? So if Jesus had to learn it that way, you and I are no exceptions. Amen? Yes. Amen? Page number 35. So let life experience teach us lessons that we cannot learn elsewhere. Life experiences that each of us go through teaches us so many things. So don't say, God, take me out of this. I'm struggling. I'm suffering. I don't want this, God. Just tell God, God, what are you teaching me through this? Okay, I'm going through this, God. What are you trying to teach me? What do you want me to learn? Okay, the quicker you learn, the quicker and better for you, okay? So some things that we need to keep in mind as we go through the preparation process. Now, when God is preparing us, what should we do? What is the first thing we need to do? Yeah, we need to cooperate with God, right? We need to cooperate with God, okay? So it's important to learn how to work with God in the preparation process. Okay, so how do we cooperate with God? We need to say, God, what are you trying to teach me through this? What are you trying to accomplish through this in this season? In the season of life, God, what are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to accomplish? And then God will speak to you. Or you can say, God, what are the things you want to build in my life? What are the things in my character that you are trying to correct or change? Okay. So it is for you to cooperate with God and allow him to do these things in your life. Don't just walk around life aimlessly saying, going through this hard time. After some time, it will just go away. No. God, what are you teaching me? What do you want me to do? What are you trying to say? What do you want me to change in my life? How do I look at this? How do I get through this, God? Teach me. So when we're willing, God speaks and he teaches us. Also, your attitude matters. I don't know if you've heard this saying, our attitude determines our altitude. Your attitude determines where you will get in life. You know, whether you want to be up there or you want to be down, it's your attitude. If you're always grumbling, complaining, murmuring, you don't want to do hard work, you want everything to come easy, you know, you can't climb up the ladder of success. Because when you want to climb up the ladder of success, it's a lot of hard work, it's a lot of perseverance, a lot of endurance, right? So, if you're constantly looking and saying, hey, people don't like me, people are always uh, complaining about me, people are always pulling me up, people are always saying I'm like this, I'm like that, poor me, poor me, you know, <laughs> that attitude, then you're going to be like a worm, just crawling on the ground. You can't reach greater heights, okay? So your attitude is very, very important. Even for God, your attitude matters. Now, this is not written in the Bible, but I'm just looking at it. You know, Joseph, why do you think Joseph, when he was taken as a slave in Potiphar's house, why do you think God made him a manager? Did he favor Joseph? Does he favor Joseph than all the others? What do you think? You think God is partial? No. Romans chapter 2 verse 11 says God does not show partiality. So did God show partiality to Joseph and made Potiphar only look at Joseph so that he can become the manager of Potiphar's house? No, but I think I read, when I look at it, I read it this way. I look at, at Joseph's attitude. What could Joseph have done? Hey, I'm a rich man, man. I'm a rich man's son. I've never done cleaning. I've never done sweeping. I've never even lifted one plate in my life. I'm not here to do any hard work. 
and just sit in a corner and cry. My, my brother sold me, my brother sold me. But what did Joseph do? Look at his attitude. His attitude was not, hey, I'm great, I'm mighty, I'm a big man's son, I'm a rich man's son, I can't sweep and swab. Jo Joseph was diligent and sincere and God saw his attitude and that is why he made Potiphar look at Joseph. Why has Potiphar to look at Joseph compared to all the other servants? See, that is a favor of God. So for God, your attitude matters. Why are you in Bible college? Not just to come, worship, classes, supernatural hour, lunch, some talk, games, go back, mobile, talking, chatting, eating and sleeping. You're not here for that. You're here to be equipped with God's word. God is giving you the time. He's given you the opportunity. People are investing in your lives. And God is going to be, uh, you know, hold you accountable for what you are doing. God is saying, hey, I brought you here to study the Bible. I hardly see you studying your notes, going through the lecture notes, preparing yourself to be equipped for your studies. Because you go back, you just sleep, then you're chatting with your friends, you're looking at mobile. Some of you are only here to learn music, instruments. Why are you here? To learn music? It's not a music school. It's not a worship school. You're here to learn about the word of God. How many of you are taking the time to read the lecture notes? How many of you are taking the time to read the Bible, to prepare? Well, God is going to hold you accountable for the time and the resources he's given to you. So don't waste your time because you're going to be accountable to God for the time that you spend. I'm going to be accountable for the time that I spend in how I prepare for my classes and come and teach. I'm accountable to God for the time I spend in the office hours that are eight hours to do my work. I was accountable to God when I was studying in Bible college, right? We had study time from uh, uh, after lunch, one to two was rest. From two to five, 30, we were in the library studying. <coughs> then from eight o'clock till 10 o'clock, we were studying in the library. We had to put in a lot of time and effort to read and to do assignments, to do research work. That is how we learned. God is going to hold you accountable. Let me tell you that, each one of you, each one of us. How we are using the time, the resources, the gifts, the talents that God has given to us. So don't waste your time, don't waste APC's time and don't waste God's time. Because that is not going to really help any of us, okay? So attitude matters. Consistency is where the power is. Okay, so Paul instructed Timothy saying, you know, give yourself entirely to the things of God so that your progress can be evident to all. So the, how do we achieve progress? We achieve progress by committing ourselves fully and be consistent in what God has asked you to do. Okay, some of us will start very strong, you know, come to Bible college, we're excited. First few weeks, we're studying God's word. After that, we are, you know, everything goes out. We lose that consistency. Consistency is very, very important. To be consistent in your character, in your commitment, in your faithfulness, in your integrity, your honesty is something that we need to be consistent. Amen? We also need to be faithful in little things. If you prove yourself faithful in little things, God will give you, promote you to greater things. So God is looking at how you're using your time, your talent, the investment that is being made in your life in Bible college, how are you faithful in that? Everything from the way you use the resources, lectures, the word of God, the resource materials, the food that you have, your faithful and small things, God will promote you to greater things. And that is the principle in God's kingdom. In principle of God's kingdom is there is progression. When you're faithful and little things, God opens the door for greater things, okay? The fifth one is beware of complacency. <clears throat> now, in the preparation time, it's very tempting to take things very, very easy. Chalta hai. Anything is okay, it's okay, we can do it, you know? Um, thinking that, hey, God has not yet taken me to my assignment, so why should I, you know, be too excited, uh, do things? So only preparation, slowly it can happen. So you might just think, okay, we'll wait and see, we'll drift through the season. But 
the longer you drift the longer you're going to keep on drifting before you see the place that god is going to take you to fulfill what he has called you to do before he releases you into your calling so don't become complacent okay look at the changes god wants you to make make those changes don't settle for anything that is you know simple and basic let god stretch you okay you know push yourself beyond your comfort zone and then you will see god using you mightily amen amen okay six one preparation time is never wasted time okay so the more the preparation the better for you and god can use you mightily you will learn precious lessons precious life lessons you know and greater will be your calling and you will be able to align yourselves to god's calling okay the seventh one don't be hasty what does proverbs chapter 21 verse 5 says when you become hasty what does it lead to proverbs 21 5 it's not here in your notes in the your... plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty oh. but those of everyone who is hasty surely to poverty so hastiness means what god fast do it fast i want the preparation to be fast i want to go where you have the the assignment and role for me so when you are hasty what happens it leads to what poverty yes so let each season fulfill its preparation course or let each season run its full course don't rush ahead of god don't run ahead of god tell your neighbor don't rush before god's timing okay so don't run ahead of god be patient right and also don't do something that you are not called to do right don't do what you are not called to do do what god has called you to do don't look at somebody else and say oh i think i'll be good doing that you know there's greater visibility there's greater you know show in that no just be faithful with god what god has called you stay within your calling and your gifting and each season of life that god takes us there is preparation he also prepares us in that season of life and he prepares us for the next season of life so be prepared for what god is even taking you to the next season of life and the last thing eighth one is god's preparation process is progressive that means it's slow it happens slowly okay god allows us um to build our character our attitude so all we need to do is be faithful in that season before god takes us to the next season or to the next level amen any questions online students you are very quiet shani no questions from you shani chapman no <laughs> didn't hear your voice last week i was thinking oh shani didn't ask any questions I was wondering whether you were in class so today i checked and yeah you were there yes any questions anything you would like to say any doubts you all have no questions no doubts all of you ready for god's preparation process yes yeah. okay Okay, there are no questions. We'll move on to chapter four. Okay, we're still in book one. We have two more books to go, and we just have like a few weeks. Okay, anyways, uh, chapter four. Chapter four is talking about what? How we need to position ourselves to fulfill God's plan and purpose for our lives. Okay, God has a plan and purpose for your life. but you need to position yourself right many times god's blessing god's anointing god's provision doesn't flow because we are not at the right place the right time to receive it but if you come in the right place in the right time we receive god's provision god's protection god's blessing and the move of god we see that in our lives okay so we look at those things in chapter 4 uh, The first one is position to fulfill his purpose. 
Okay, so what does it mean position to fulfill his purpose? It just simply means that each one of us have to learn to be in the right place at the right time, doing the right things for God to, for God to fulfill his purpose and for the anointing and the grace and the blessing too, and the provision and the protection to flow through. Okay, so let's look at an example about positioning ourselves to fulfill his purpose. Okay, about Esther. Esther was, uh, what was her race? She was a Jew, right? Esther was a Jew, but she was married to whom? She was married to a pagan king, right? He was not a Jew. And the Jews are not allowed to marry anyone outside the Jewish, uh, you know, uh, race, okay? But she married this pagan king, uh, and she was taken to the palace, and she was brought up by whom? Who was Esther brought up by? Her cousin Mordecai, okay? So Mordecai just sent her and, you know, couldn't do anything. He said, maybe it's God's will plan, takes her. And she becomes the next queen for King Ahasuerus, the king of Persia, okay? And uh, there was a time when, you know, um, the, uh, the close official to the king, he was so angry with Mordecai that he not only wanted to kill and destroy Mordecai, but he also wanted to kill and destroy all the Jews, so he spoke to the king and the king said on such and such a day, all the Jews, whether young, old, children, infants, all of them will be, can be killed. Okay. And so when Mordecai heard this, she, he sends news to Esther. He says, go to Esther, go and tell the king that this is what your people are facing and, and save us. So Esther sends word and says, hey, I can't go to the king because it's three months since the king has called me. And in those days, if the king does not call even the queen, she cannot go into his presence. She goes without her being called. You know, she can, it can even result in death or end in death. So Mordecai tells her, you know, if you are not going to bring about deliverance for the Jews, God will bring about it in some other way. Okay? But know this, you and your father's house will perish. And he tells her, who knows that God has brought you in this kingdom to be the queen for such a time as this so that you can save your people. Okay. So what do we learn from this? Queen Esther was at the right place at the right time. She has to do the right thing. So she, she says, okay, let's fast and pray. They fast and pray. And without being called, she goes to the king's chamber and God gives a favor. The king stretches out his staff and says, ask me anything and I'll give you up to half my kingdom. And that is how Esther saves the king. So we can ask, okay, why did God take Esther to uh, get her married to this pagan king for such a time as this? So for Queen Esther was at the right time, the right place. She did the right thing. She was able to save the people of Jews. Okay, did you get that? Yes or no? So when God positions us in a place, we must see that as something significant, something strategic that God is doing for us, that he wants to extend his kingdom through you. So many of you are in the right place here in APC Bible College, doing the right thing. Start, you know, you're in the right place, the right time. It's important for you to do the right thing. Study God's word, equip yourself with God's word. Okay. So you need to look at everything in a perspective of building God's kingdom. For example, your studies, your college degrees. Don't just look at it, okay, I'm getting a degree, okay? But look at it as something more significant. For example, you have a job. Don't just look at it as a job that you're getting to earn your bread and butter, to just eat your food, pay your rent, you know, buy things, okay? Uh, don't look at your relationships as something, okay, God brought this person in my life, fine. God gave me these parents, fine. God gave me these siblings, fine. God brought me this person as my uh, partner, fine. But look at everything. It is something of a greater significance, greater significance for the kingdom of God. Look at everything with the perspective of God wants to do something through this to extend his kingdom, whether it's your studies, 
whether it's your certificates, the degrees that you get, whether it's your job, whether it's your business, your vocation, whether it's your, your children, your family, everything is significant because God is using that to extend and build his kingdom. Okay. So when you learn to look at this every in this way, everything in life will be having a greater meaning, a greater significance, a greater purpose that, hey, you're doing something to build the kingdom of God. Even your marriage. I'm not just marrying because everybody has to marry. But through this marriage, I want God to release his kingdom work through us. Through this job, I want God to release his kingdom work in my job. Through my family, wherever we are going to take our house, I want God to release his kingdom work in that locality, in that city. God takes you to an, another city to minister. God is taking you to extend his kingdom there. So look at everything with that perspective. So when you look at everything with that perspective, you have a greater significance, a greater meaning for uh, life, and you will be able to influence the kingdom of God. Okay? The second one is position to receive um, his provision. Okay? So if you want to receive or you, you want to see God as Jehovah Jireh, your provider, what should you do? You need to position yourself right. Okay? So look at uh, an example of Elijah. Now, Elijah, God tells him, go to King Ahab and tell him there's not going to be rain in the land. Now, in those days, you cannot go to the king's uh, room without his permission, without him calling you, and you cannot take a bad news to the king. So here was Elijah, no permission. The king did not call him, and he was not dressed appropriate. He had you know, camel skin and long hair. You're not supposed to go like that in the presence of the king. And did he have good news or bad news for the king? Ba good news. Rain. No rain. Bad news. Okay. So the bad news is there's not going to be any rain. So any king would get very, very upset. Okay. Because it's going to affect his place. So what does he do? He goes and he tells the king. And immediately he runs away. And God says, hey, go to the brook of Cherit. Go to a small stream. And there you will drink the water and I will get you to uh, the ravens to feed you. Please give him the mic. He wants to, you want the mic, Prem? You can let him have the mic, please. Let him have the mic so that he can read. You can just pass that mic to him. And pass that mic back, yeah. Yes, you have a question? Okay, so here we see that Elijah, he obeyed God. What did he do? He went to that stream. And God fed him and he drank water. So all of Israel was not having water to drink. But here was Elijah being provided with food and water. Now when that stream dried up, God told Elijah, go to the town of Zarephath and a woman will take care of, a widow woman will take care of you. He obeys God, he goes to Zarephath, sees his widow woman and the widow woman, her son and Elijah have food to eat for the rest of the days of famine compared to anyone else in the city. Now, what if Elijah would have said, God, how can I go to that stream? All the soldiers are looking for me. Why can't you give me a cave to hide? You know, in the forest, in the mountains, some cave, which is much safer. If I'm going like this in the open, in the stream, the soldiers will find me and they will take me to King Ahab and I will die. And when God says, go to Zarephath, he's saying, God, Zarephath, that's the the place of this wicked queen Jezebel. You know, if I go to this town, people will see me. They'll tell the king. They will capture me. And how can I go and live with a widow woman who does not have a husband? What will people say? I'm a man. But what does Elijah do? He just obeys God. No questions asked. And what was the result? Everyone around were not having food. Everyone around was not having water to drink. But Elijah had food to drink along with water. Okay. So what did Elijah do? He was at the right time, the right place, doing the right thing that God had asked him to do, and he experienced divine provision. Yes. Uh, Ma'am, how do we know that we are at the right place and at the right time? Good question. How do you know you're the right place at the right time? When you, when you see God fulfilling his promise to you, 
when you see things happening, you know, there's no obstructions, there's no difficulties, there's no, you're saying, hey, I'm investing in this thing, but nothing is working. You know, why? Maybe you're in the wrong place. And you see God's provision, you see God's protection. When you experience all of this, you know you are the right place at the right time. Also, the Holy Spirit tells you, because the Holy Spirit will say, hey, this is not the place. And you easily know that when you're not in the right place, doing the right thing, you'll experience so many difficulties compared to, I'm not saying when you're in the right place that you will not have any difficulties. There will be challenges, but you will see God come through for you. You will see God's provision. And that is miraculous. And you know, hey, I'm in the right place. But ma'am, if, if that, if, okay, we are in the right place, but if the time is taking so long, so how can we encourage ourselves that, okay, this is the right place you are, like, how do we know that? Thing? Uh, because you don't want to, you don't, uh, you don't see the end result of it. You see little, little things that God is doing. And you, you rejoice in those little things, little miracles, little provisions, life's changed, life's transformed, you know, things coming together, people, God opening doors for you, orchestrating situations, you know, supernatural provisions, everything you know, slowly, slowly, step by step, you see and you experience and you know. Because when you start doing something, you don't see the end result, right? It takes time. But you see those small victories that you win and you know that, hey, this is the right place. Yes. Like, for example, when I was in children's ministry, I was not taught about children's ministry, even in Bible college, um, what to do, how to do ministry, how to write lessons, nothing. But when I just obeyed God's call and I came, everything God, you know, he gave me creative ideas. He taught me how to revamp things, how to start things. I've started two new projects, how to start things, how to go about doing it, God's provision of finances, even writing those curriculums, everything. God bringing people, God taking out people who are not supposed to be there, God bringing the right people in the team, God giving opportunities in, in, in schools. And I know all along that I've been in the right place. Yes. But, uh, and I look at like change of children and things like that. But you, you ask me, do you think I'm like Paul saying, I finished the race? No. There's so many things I still have to do. Yes. yes. Uh, Ma'am, if God has a plan for a person, hmm. uh, he chose a person, hmm. but that person is not willing or being so rebellious, God will choose another person for the same plan? But it, it differs. In in Bible, we see Moses were, were so faithful in all the things. In the sight of the Lord, he is so uh, but faithful. But Moses initially was not, right? He did according to his flesh. Yeah. It delayed the process, but God still used him. But Even we, Paul, 30 years. No, but God still uh, used him. Yes. But uh, we see in Old Testament, like Jonah. Jonah. Yeah, Jonah, when he is so rebellious, he is not willing to do the will of God. He is going somewhere else. Tarsus. And also he is ready to suicide. He yes. said to that boater, you put me in the sea, you will be escaped. I, I may die because I know what I have did. Hmm. But still God um, didn't choose another person. He saved Jonah and uh, he, he again put in, put in the land. He God's a God of uh, second chances. He gives us second chances. He just doesn't write us off he's patient with us yes yes uh though that's why paul says in romans chapter 2 the goodness of god leads to repentance he also says in chapter 2 that god is gracious merciful forbearing long suffering that means he's patient with us he's patient because he knows that jonah will come around do th he will go to nineveh but even if god uh, you know um uh, even if he doesn't God can still, God is sovereign. He will still bring about his divine plans and purposes. He will still accomplish his divine plans and purposes. He can use anyone else as well. Yes. Okay. But still we see some people are believed, but could not uh, enter the promise of the land like Cain and Simpson. It is written in the New Testament. Those people were believed and called chosen, but could not able to see the um, whole plans of God. 
no actual question is is it uh, if if a god chose one person mm -hmm. he will use that person whatever it happen or uh, being no, he is no, not god willing does not, god does not override our will and our choice he does not override our will and choice if he is overridden our will and choice he's given us this he's given us the gift of volition given us the will to do our whatever we choose and will if he was a god who overrides things then he could have done stop the sin from adam and eve right he does not because earth is given to man psalm 115 verse 16 earth is belongs to heavens belongs to the lord the earth is given to man right so when he does that he doesn't override our will at any point he lets us choose whatever we want to choose we face the consequences of that but irrespective of that god goes ahead and he brings about his plans and his purposes but his plans and purposes are not thwarted it's not stopped because i don't give in i don't do it no god can still go about doing his plans and his purposes yes did that help yes okay so we'll move on the next one is position to be protected okay so if you want to experience the position of uh, protection of god you need to be at the right place at the right time to do the right thing okay so which means if you look at psalms chapter 91 it says in verse 1 can somebody read that please psalms 91 verse 1 he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Amen. Which means that, you know, if we, when you are in the secret place under the shadow of his wings, what will you experience? You will experience his protection. Safety. Safety. Yes. That's why it says he will be your refuge, your fortress. He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. So our protection is connected with the fact that who have we made as our dwelling place? Okay. Who, is our, who should be our dwelling place? If God most high is our dwelling place, then we are receiving that protection. If we don't make God our dwelling place, then this promise does not good, hold good for us. If you read Psalm 91, it's a very powerful uh, psalm. It's a psalm of uh, protection of God, divine protection of God. And, you know, when you read the psalm, it's important that when you dwell in the shadow of the Almighty, or when you dwell under his wings, that means under his protection, when you come under his protection, then you will receive his protection. If you choose to come out of his protection, then you are exposing yourself to the elements of this world and also to Satan. So the, the best place to be is to be in the center of God's will, doing what God wants to do for what, what he wants you to do in your life. Okay. So when you're doing God's will, you receive his protection, you receive his providence. Okay. You also receive um, his blessings and you also position yourself for promotion. How, how many of you like to be promoted? Yes. Yeah, good. We all like promotion, right? We don't like to be where we are. Okay. So, um, for we need to position ourselves in life correctly if we want to receive promotion. Okay. So, to grow up in the things of God, to grow into the purposes of God, we need to position ourselves right. So I'll give you an example of King David. Okay. Now, remember I told you that King David, when he was 23 years old, okay, when King Saul died, okay, what happens? He inquires of God. He tells God, okay, God, what do you want me to do next? King Saul is dead. And God tells him, go to where does God tell him to go to? I said that in the last hour. Go to Hebron, right? God tells him go to Hebron. And when he goes to Hebron, the tribe of Judah makes him as king. Okay. Now, what if David did not ask God? David said, okay, King Saul is dead. I'm very happy in these caves. Like, um, what is that? Jungle man. What is... Um, 
Tarzan, yes, like Tarzan, you know, jumping from trees to trees and just in the forest, enjoying the scenery and the beauty. God, I'm got used to living in caves. I'm happy here. I know, living like a vagabond. What if you think that David did that? He would have continued to live for the rest of his life just as a ruler over those 400 men. He wouldn't have become the king. But look at what David does, you know. He goes to God and tells him, God, what should I do next? Okay. So, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. You know, David says, God, can I go up into any of the cities of Judah? So he's saying, God, can I move into city life? From the cave life to the city life, can I move? And God says, promises him, yeah, okay, go. Then he says, where should I go? God says, go to Hebron. And there we see that, you know, he's made as king. So when we position ourselves in the right place, the right time, we will receive our promotion. Okay. The next one is to position ourselves in the current move of God. Okay. So, you know, uh, the last, that is, I think the last thing, okay, to position ourselves to the move of God. Now, God has not stopped working. Okay. Does God still do miracles today? Does God still do uh, the supernatural today? Yes. Is God still bringing about revivals today? Yes. The moves of God? Yes. yes. Okay. So we can't live in the past. We can't say, okay, God moved on the day of Pentecost, AD 30 to AD 33, somewhere that time was the Pentecost. God, the Pentecost, he did, you know, there was a mighty revival. You know, the Holy Spirit came. Uh, you know, they were baptized, they spoke in tongues. Great. We live in that. The early church did great signs and miracles. We'll preach about that and teach about that. Okay. That is not what God wants us to be living in, in the past. Yes, God wants us to look at the past and learn from the past. Hey, when it happened on Pentecost, why can't it happen today? That is what we need to say. God, you did it in Pentecost. We want that move today. See? God, there was a reformation that happened in the 1400s, okay, with Martin Luther, the reformation, there's a revival that happened, mighty revival that swept through America, that swept through England, you know, so many missionaries were sent, so many lives were changed, God, we want to see that kind of revival in our city, amen, amen, yes, so when you look at the past, we learn from the past, but we don't just stay in the past. God, thank you for what you did through Martin Luther. God, uh, thank you for what you did through uh, Zwingli. Or to, you know, the Asbury revival. Or, you know, all of those great revivals. Okay? The Azusa Street revival. Great things, God. I read it. It's just so great, God. You're such a great, mighty God. But saying, God, you did that then. Why can't you do it now in my day? In our time? I want to see that, God. I'm excited to see that. So we need to be positioned for the current move of God. That means we need to be mindful of what God is doing in our city and town, in our nation and the nations of the world. Not saying, you know, hey, it's the end times now. God is going to come soon. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. I'm saved. I can speak in tongues. Thank God I'm going to heaven. Hey, that's one way is okay. But what should you do? You need to pray for Lost souls. God, you're coming. So many people are dying, God. You know, it needs to be a revival. Just one revival, God. And this whole city has just changed. This whole country and this nation and the nations of the world has just changed. Just God bring about that revival because there is no time. So we need to be ready with the current move of God. Because God is accelerating things. You know, that's what Pastor said in his, uh, in his uh, the, the week before last message. You know, he's saying, hey, we're talking about 666, you know, the, the end times, um, you know, the, uh, 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 you know, the rapture and all of those things. But, you know, God is accelerating things. He's moving things fast because he's coming again. Things are changing. So what should you and I do? Look at what he's done in the past. And move according to the current move of God. And say, God, we need a move from you. We need a visitation. There's so much of immorality in our city, in our nation, God, in the nations of the world. Just a revival will just, you know, bring about such a change in lives, change in, in cities, 
you know, pornography, addictions, everything will be wiped off God. Just do that. So that is what we need to be engaging in, not just living in the past. We look at uh, one or two examples. Um, you know, this bronze serpent in Numbers chapter 21, verses 5 to 9. Okay. Uh, the, the Israelites, they spoke against God and against Moses. God was very angry. And what did he send? What did God send? Serpents, fiery serpents. And it bit people and people were dying. And what did Moses do? What did Moses do? Well, don't read the Old Testament. What did Moses do? He prayed and asked God to forgive them. What did God tell him to do? Make a bronze snake, put it on a pole. All those who are bitten by that snake, let them look at it and they will be healed. So Moses does that, that, does that and everybody is healed. But look at what happens. God just gave that as a remedy, okay? But people were locked into that. They were locked into that fact that God did this one time, but, you know, they took it as God's way. And they made that as a idol and they started worshipping that. That's what we read in 2 Kings chapter 18 verse 4, okay? Hey, God did that as a remedy. He ceased doing that. He stopped doing that and he's moved on. Move on with God. But people were not moving on with God. They were holding on to that bronze serpent and they were worshipping that as an idol and that became a hindrance from them worshipping God himself. Let's look at another example about Moses. What did Moses do? Moses strikes the rock Water comes out the first time God tells him to do that. The second time God tells him, what should he do? Speak to the rock. But what does Moses do? He got so angry with the people, took the rock, bang, bang, he went twice. And water, but water came out of it, but there was judgment on Moses. God said, Moses, you disobeyed me and you will not enter the promised land. You failed to do what I wanted you to do. Yes, God did the certain thing in the passed through Moses. He told him to strike it. But this time it was a different move of God. God told him to speak to the rock, but he, you know, went ahead and disobeyed God and he lost out on his portion. God, the plan and purpose of him to enter the promised land. So you see the consequences. When we don't keep in step with what God wants us to do in our lives, we step out of God's uh, you know, provision for our lives. The last example we look at is John's disciples. Now, before John, the, before Jesus came, who was preaching and teaching about the kingdom of God and baptizing people? John the Baptist, Baptist. right? But look at what his disciples do. John the Baptist was uh, uh, baptizing people, but when Jesus came, all of the disciples were following John. Who do they start following? Jesus. Okay, because John said, hey, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So we see it's very interesting in uh, John chapter 1 verse 37, his disciples, John the Baptist disciples left him and they followed Jesus. Okay, what if they refuse to follow Jesus? What if they say, hey, he's not the Messiah, John, we want to follow you. We are happy with you. They wouldn't have experienced the current move of God. Okay. So it's important for us, if you want to fulfill the plans and purposes for God in our lives, you know, we need to position ourselves in God's plan. Uh, we need to position ourselves to be protected. We need to position ourselves so that we can receive his protection, his provision, his promotion, and also position ourselves in the current move of God. Okay. We'll stop here. John has a question. Esther marrying a pagan king and God uses her for a purpose. Does that mean it's God's approval of marrying a pagan, a believer marrying a non-believer? No, that is not God's will. Because whenever we uh, interpret scripture, we always have to interpret scripture in the light of the rest of scripture. Because scripture always interprets the rest of scripture. We can't take one scripture and interpret that in isolation. It will be an error. It will be a misinterpretation. So here, you know, 
for the limited revelation and understanding they had. Of course, they were not supposed to marry pagan kings, but it was out of her jurisdiction to stop it because she was taken by the, um, you know, by the soldiers. She was taken and she was chosen as a king. But we see that God had a greater purpose for that. But so can we use that as an example today from a believer marrying a non-believer? No, because the word of God clearly says, Paul mentions what can light have with darkness, okay? Light and darkness cannot come together, okay? The kingdom of God, the kingdom of Belial, that is the kingdom of Satan, cannot be together. They're contrast, different. And so it very clearly says that, there, that an unbeliever cannot be yoked, uh, a believer cannot be yoked with an unbeliever. That is what scripture says. So always interpret scripture, the rest of scripture, and interpret anything in the nature, in the light of what, who God is and what he expects us. So what is, how do we interpret this in the nature of God? The nature of God is God is holy. He wants us to be holy. If you marry an unbeliever, that is not holiness. That is not doing right in God's eyes. That is against his nature. God will never tell us to do anything contrary to his nature. I hope that helped John. Uh, uh, Shani Chapman, when is our first assessment? Our first assessment will be after we finish this uh, book. Okay? Fulfilling God's purpose for your life. It'll be, I think, this month. I I'll let you know the date. I'll give you time. Okay, thank you everyone for uh, joining class today. Have a blessed um, day and a, a blessed weekend ahead. Thank you. God bless.